Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Carla, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Carla. Now, see, what I just heard her say was that if you don't see me, the talk is just worthless. You know, so... <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> You know, because I got bent ears, you know, I just, uh, no, I'm better than that now, but uh, uh, sometimes, I'm so glad to be here. I want to thank Carolyn and Ellen and the committee for asking us to come out here this year. Um, We've just been looking forward to this. We hear about it from everybody, everywhere we hear about this conference, and and, uh, we took the zip line today, and and, uh, uh, at the at the bottom of it, the, one of the photographers is uh, the son of one of our friends who came here for years. He brought his family here for summer vacation. Now he lives here, and and it's just uh, it's just uh, amazing, amazing. So thank you, thanks very much for having us. And we've had a host of hosts and uh, and food. I mean, we we might not have to eat for about a month, and we'd still be okay. This it, it's just been amazing. All the uh, the warm welcome. And uh, thank you, Debbie and Kim, and uh, just the warm welcome. We got to spend some time with Lee and Hannah today, and uh, we always see them in passing, and we love them to death. They're like family. They're our family of understanding, you know, And uh, uh, but today we got to actually sit down. So I hope that you all are having as good a time as we are. Um, when Doug and I, you heard of some of the travails of us tr- just trying to get here, and it wasn't un- it wasn't unfun. It was fun for us. We just didn't always know the right thing to do, you know, at all times. And you know, of course, once that falls into place, you can have fun. So we drove down here, and we came in here in the rain, trying to, uh, you know, really hard to make Sterling's talk on Monday night, and and we we made it over here, found the building, and walked in, and we were like, okay, now where? And we heard the laughter coming from this room, and we said, there, in there. We didn't even have to skip a beat. In there. There it is. And and uh, so we knew where to come. And, uh, oh, boy, I'm just really glad to be here and had a bunch of things to say. I was going to be so uh, – uh, I, I want to thank everybody for their talk, Sterling and, and my husband, uh, Doug, you heard, and, and uh, Maria last night just, just cut it to the – just cl- cleared it all up. And uh, I just uh, just really appreciated everybody's talks. And – I love the way you did the countdown tonight, and I'll tell you who loves it just a little bit better than I loved is my husband, um, who is three months longer sober than I than I am, and uh, it, so for this three months during the summer, he gets to stand up longer than I do, and uh, when they do the when they do the countdown right, you know, sometimes they lump us in together, you know, they'll do like. 25 to 30 or something like that. And then he, he doesn't like that. But, uh, (laughs) once in a while we get it right, you know, you get it right. And he'll, he'll be in the 26 to 30 category and he'll turn and he'll go like that to me as I have to sit down. So I just say, enjoy it, honey. Cause in three months I'm coming at you. So anyway, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thrilled to be here. We've met some nice people this week and, and I just can't, can't think of anything I'd like to do better than carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, there are a lot of ways to get sober, and I, for every time that we say only AA, somebody else will have something else to say, and that's okay. I found it here. Um, my sobriety date is September 25th, 1987, and before that, I never did anything for 25 years in a row on purpose that was of any value. I, I had to come here to get a life, you know what I mean? And I stand on the foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and, and, and that's for me and, and, and I'm, I'm not going anywhere. And so to, uh, to have the privilege of being able to carry the message and what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me is, um, just something I love to do. I love to do. And I hope that you hear it. I hope that if you're new, that you hear something in here that'll ask you, that'll, that'll help you to stay one more day, just one more day, midnight to midnight. Um, huh. When I got here, I thought it was very important to try to figure out why I'm an alcoholic. You know, was it my crazy, dark, dramatic, violent, perverted family? If you had my family, you'd drink too. No, and I found out that'll give you an inventory, but it doesn't make me alcoholic. (laughs) Uh, I've been around here long enough to see people who live charm childhoods. My husband's one of those. He's got just a real healthy family. You know, they don't have to go to class to learn how to love each other. They just do. And... uh, 
Uh, yet he sits right next to me in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Same thing happens to him when he takes a drink of alcohol that happens to me. He can't guarantee if he's going to have two or 22. And uh, when he puts it down for any amount of time, once that obsession is, has been uh, uh, developed, then it's, it's all he can think about. He's just like me. I'm either drinking or thinking about drinking, drinking or thinking about drinking, drinking or thinking about drinking. And that's him too. So I don't know why I'm an alcoholic. I just know that I am, and I'm glad I am. And, and besides that, I don't want you to think my childhood was all bad anyway. I had a great time in elementary school. Fourth, fifth, and sixth grade were just terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I was involved, you know. I was a new kid on the block a lot. So I'd find out, what are we doing? What are we doing? New school, what are we doing? You know, if we're running track, I wanted to run track. If we were, if we were uh, doing school politics, I wanted to run uh, for office. If we were doing academics, I wanted to know the answers. I wanted to do it. Let's do it. You know, playing softball. Phew. You know, but the trouble with me and my kind of ego, though, is that I needed to be the first around the track, you know, and I needed to be president, and I needed to be, uh, know all the answers, you know, and I needed to, I wanted to be the first woman Major League Baseball player, and the first woman president, and, and the first woman to run a four-minute mile, and, you know, God, by the time sixth grade was over, I was tired, I needed a drink. <laughs> <laughs> because when you're running the world and you're 10, you know, that's a big job. <laughs> And alcohol started to work for me. You know, I, uh, I got my first social resentment behind a game of spin the bottle. And uh, I know they don't even play that game these days, do they? Do, they just get right down to business. And uh, <laughs> well, we played it back then, you know. And, uh, and it was during that summer right before going up into seventh grade, between sixth and seventh grade elementary school, and you're kind of moving up, and puberty, you know, you're prepubescent and all of that, and boys are taking a, a much different role in my life. Boys my age were anyway, and, and uh, uh, so we were at my friend Leonard's house, and we were playing spin the bottle and passing around a bottle of his dad's whiskey, and, and uh, now these weren't the first drinks I ever took, but these were the ones that really, really started to let me know that I, I made the connection. Alcohol would do something for me I couldn't do for myself, you know? I started to notice that. And, and so we spun the bottle, and the bottle landed on me, and I went off into the bedroom with one of the boys, and we were both doing the same thing as far as I could tell. But when we came back out of that bedroom, they called him a player and me a slut. And I did not think that was fair. I still don't think it's fair if you want to know the truth. <laughs> but every sponsor I've ever had has told me the fair comes around once a year, and it lasts two weeks. That's all you get, so, so much for fair. <laughs> And, you know, I was of such a self-centered mind at the time, you know, and I don't know if that's age or what, you know, but, but it never occurred to me to ask such pertinent questions as, as, do you have a boyfriend? I mean, do you have a girlfriend? You know, I mean, it never occurred to me to ask those important questions. And so I got a reputation I didn't understand, nor could I take responsibility for it. And, and uh, you know, boys my age were looking at me funny, and so were the girls. And, and school, which had been my last bastion of refuge, um, started not to work for me either. And I started to you know, kind of melting to the background. My pride kicked in, my feelings were hurt, and I did what I do, you know. My, I, I start to back away from my life, and I started spending more time in the girls' room than I did in the classroom and hanging out with the other girls who were doing the same thing. And we'd bring stum stuff from our mother's medicine cabinets and from their liquor cabinets and hang out until after a while school just didn't work for me either. And I needed to find something else because I'm proactive, you know. I take action. I do. I really do. I don't, it's I'm ready, fire, aim. And... Um, <laughs> I uh, I started to leave home, you know, all it really takes for me. I've got a gypsy soul. I don't know about you, but I've got that gypsy soul. I've got that wanderlust, you know. All it really takes for me is a long, slow train with Selena Willie Nelson song, you know, and I'm on the road on the road again, you know. And I'd get out there on the on-ramps of the 10 freeway coming east and the 101 going north, and I'd stick my little thumb out, and I'd crawl in the car or the truck going wherever with whoever, and I'd be on my way to somewhere else. And I love that feeling. Hope is just up the road. It's just just up there. That anticipation. That's where I live, is in the anticipation, the fantasy. It feels like the bottle in the glove compartment for me. I don't even have to have that thing open yet to know that I'm already on my way. And I love that. Trouble with being young and out on the road is that I, I started spending time, I'd get caught, I'd get picked up, and I'd started spending some time in the Southern California hot spots like Indio Jail and Riverside Juvenile Hall and LA Central Juvenile Hall. And we did that dance for a while. They'd send me home to mom and home to dad. And then, and then uh, I was, the stints inside would get longer and longer. And you know, my insanity even back then was that it, I, I, sw I swore, you know, I, I, you know, and you want to do good, you want to do well, you don't want to mess up that way that time, but I'd be back on the street doing the very thing that got me locked up in the first place. 
And by the time I was 14, I found myself in a place called North Beach in the San Francisco area. Uh, a friend of mine was with me. We were uh, sitting in a, a place called Isla Vista, California, and we got one ride, one long ride, all the way up into San Francisco, and the guy dropped us off right in the middle of North Beach. And to my left was uh, the Condor Club with Carol Dota on the marquee, and to my right uh, there were hookers and dealers and pimps. Oh, my. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, it was a party town, and, and we weren't on that street for 10 minutes before a couple of guys approached us, offered us money for sex, and we said yes and did the next indicated thing, and boom, a whole new career path opened up for us. <laughs> and I started living a day at a time in a way I've not had to live in a very, very long time. And I don't want to judge, you know, I'm not the arbiter of anybody's sex behavior. You know, I know people, I've, I've heard the stories. I know people uh, and know of people who did very well in that profession. So I'm not going to judge that. You know, there are a lot of people who seem to have done very well. I'm not one of them. It didn't, <laughs> you know, I read, I'd read about the Mayflower Madam who in New York, you know, helped all these women. They got college degrees and did very well. I mean, she was kind of like the Bergdorf Goodman of the whole profession. You know what I mean? And, and my trouble was I was just more like the 99 cent store. It was just. You know. So, and our book talks about our alcoholic life seeming, be, seeming to be the only normal one, and, and it certainly seemed that way for me, and I caught that early. Any sign of talent or gifts that I had, uh, I traded away early for the effect that alcohol would produce. Early and willingly. I, I thought. You know, I didn't, under, I, I didn't consciously understand, now this is going to go. If you go there, this is going to go, but I did it anyway. That effect was so strong and so powerful, and it preserved the illusion that I was where I was supposed to be. Um, when I was 15, I was locked up in a mental hospital. <laughs> I'd been a little busy. <laughs> a court-appointed psychiatrist said, we want to put you in there for just a couple weeks' observation. You know, we just want to... We just want to check you out, and I ended up being there for a year. I <laughs> just sort of made myself at home and moved in. Um, they were not talking to me a lot about alcoholism. They were talking to me about disorders. I was a very disordered-looking chi child by that time. I was alternately violent and withdrawn and living with a level of frustration down in my gut I didn't know how to talk about. It wasn't until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous 15 years later that I heard someone say that they felt like a scream without a mouth. And I thought, you know, you know. You know, but back then I looked, this was not a, a treatment center, it was a, me a mental hospital. My, there weren't a lot of treatment centers out at that time, and there certainly weren't any for adolescents. So my roommates were, uh, had some serious illnesses, real schizophrenia, real manic depression, real stuff. And untreated, I look a lot like them. So they were giving me daily nutritional supplements, a Thorazine, Malarel, Valium, Dalmain sleepers. I suppose they were concerned I wouldn't sleep. <laughs> and I had become intimately familiar with five-point restraints, and that's what I look like at 15. I was so, I'm so fortunate to, you know, it took me a long time. I had to wear, like Chuck C. used to say, I had to burn all the excuses, but by the time I was 29 years old and I came into Alcoholics Anonymous tired enough and out of ideas enough to pick up the tools you handed me, I started to apply them to my life. And to this day, 25 plus years later, when I apply the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous to my life, I get better. I do okay. You know, and that's how I know I'm alcoholic. It's experiential, though. I had to try it, but I had to be tired enough to try it. Father Tom Weston always says, <laughs> got to be pretty sick and tired to find us interesting. <laughs> 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 but when you do, you know, by the t when you do. So I'm in this hospital, and if you don't want to go crazy in the nut house, you got to get busy. And one of my favorite ways to be busy, I've already told you, was boys. I loved all the boys, but my favorites were those sexy, smoldering types. You know the kind. They just sit back there and simmer. And you just never really knew when they were going to blow, did you? <laughs> you know. You know who I'm talking about. I know we got some guys like that in here tonight, because I can see the smoke curling up from the corners. <laughs> But the trouble with guys like that in the nut house is that they're usually hiding from a junior prison sentence. They don't want to go to YA. They don't want to go to California Youth Authority. They've done something, and now they, if they lay low in the nut house long enough, they'll be okay. But they can't. They can't. Can they? They're, you know, trying to lay low and not blow, and they can't. And, uh, like, my first boyfriend, he blew when he threw a chair through the big plate glass window of the boys' unit. And, and uh, then my next boyfriend, he blew when he threw a nurse through the big plate glass window of the boys' unit. And so that was progressive, too. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know about you, but I've always thought I should have a soundtrack to my life. 
you know, music playing in the background of all this drama going on, right? Don't you have your favorite songs that just go to the same old, same old... You know, we used to play those sentimental jailhouse songs like, Who, when will I see you again? You know, and press our little faces up against the window and long for what we couldn't have across the way in the boys' unit. You know? <laughs> and again, you know, there's that anticipation. Isn't that where it is? Right there in the longing. It's in the longing. It's never in the getting. You get it, you got to get another one. It's not good enough, right? You got to get another one. Oh, but it's in that, oh, as soon as I, as soon as I. As soon as I, mm, right there. Anyway, one afternoon I was sitting outside on the smoke break bench watching my boyfriend Terry being cuffed and escorted off by security. He's the one who threw the chair through the window and he's gone, he's going. I'm never going to see him again. You know, and that was a good three or four week long relationship, you know. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I, so I was smoking my tragic cigarettes and channeling Greta Garbo and. <sighs> I, I, it was all, all, almost more than I could take, and he's gone, he's going. I can see the last of him going around the corner, and just inside the girls' unit, I could hear Diana Ross singing at top decibel, touch me in the morning, and then just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it took me a long time to realize I was brokenhearted and blue before I ever had a real date. <laughs> Because it was, it was what I was looking with. I was looking out there and what I was looking with. And, and the trouble with, uh, trouble that, with looking for, uh, for what I needed out there was that I was always about half a bubble off what it was I thought I saw anyway. You know, I'd mistake arrogance for confidence. I'd mistake sex for love. I'd mistake brute strength for strength of character. And I'd get it up in my hot little hands and it would dissolve where I stood because it wasn't it. It wasn't it. I had to come to AA to learn that it's when I'm thinking of you that gaping hole in my soul gets smaller when I'm thinking of how I can help meet your needs. I'm trying to be a service. But I didn't know that. I had to come here to learn that. And uh, I went from the girls' unit to the co-ed unit to the unit where they put the kids they just don't know what to do with anymore. I turned sweet 16 in the nut house, and by the time I got there, I was a vision for you. You know, I... Uh, I uh, know it was no longer bathing or getting dressed because you don't have to do that to date in the nut house. And uh, I had casts on both my arms up to my shoulders because you do, I was cutting and uh, it had nothing to do with suicide. It was just a different way to change my reality. You know, when you're untreated, you got no steps, fellowship, God, on my understanding, I got no booze. Untreated, I'm itchy, I can't fit in my skin. I met the love of my life there in that unit, <laughs> ended up going over the wall for the last time. And that's me, you know, I'd walk the walk, talk the talk, and up the wall over and out. Walk the walk, talk the talk, up the wall over and out. And I know that we can do that here in AA too. Thank God I was beat up enough to know, to remember that. I, we, stay, we lasted about two and a half weeks, and then my probation officer, oddly enough, learned exactly where to find me, and it hurt my feelings to find out he'd called her. <laughs> She's right here. Come get her. <laughs> and then most of my adolescence, for the rest of my adolescence, I was in one lockup or another, one treatment place or another, sitting in front of a judge, waiting for placement, juvenile hall, then off to placement, juvenile hall, then off to placement, juvenile hall, then off to placement. And I ended up in a girl's home at the end of all of that. And here's where I just want to tell you that I've been a seeker. I told you early on, I'm proactive. I, I know that there, I have always known that there is some great power that runs in and around and through us. I have been in touch with that since I was a kid, or at least known that, there, that it existed. Maintaining that relationship is another story. You know, and as, as I grew up and as fear set in and the worldly clamors and all of those things, you know, and then when alcohol came into my life, man, it just seemed like it hooked me back up. Alcohol became the power. It did the growing up for me. It did the feeling for me. It did the looking out for me for me. You know, it just, it did it all and gave me the illusion I was hooked up to that great power. And the only trouble with that is that it dumped me at one point. At some point down the line, it dumped me and I had to find a power greater than alcohol. But I tried a lot of things. And it wasn't that those things don't work for people. I, I get crazy when I hear people say, I wish they had what we have in here. We have great, a great thing in here for people like me. But out there, they've had it for a long time. Lots of people have had it for a long time out there. We rent from them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, I know some people don't like that, but I, but I, um, it, 
it, it worked for, you know, I was born into a Southern Baptist home, and that worked very well for my mother till the day she died four years ago. Now, it didn't make her, she, she had a lot of other problems, but that, that worked for her, that spiritual practice. I tried being a Catholic for a couple of weeks in the fourth grade, and, uh, you know, and I, the trouble with that is I'm about as deep as a mud puddle, you know? I Like, if it's not working right now, I got to go, you know? And, and I was, but I was just, I, I always saw it from the outside, what it looked like. You know, I love the little pictures of little girls in white dresses with the missiles and the candles and the ritual. And I thought, that's got to do something. And, and, it, and it didn't for me because I don't stay long enough. I don't know how to persevere. I don't know anything. Character and Carla do not go in the same sentence, you know? <laughs> I have nothing. I have no stick to itiveness. Not there. I burned black candles for a couple of years and prayed to the other guy for a while, you know, just hedging my bets, really. Just, just, <laughs> I just want to be on the side that's winning. I don't care. And, uh, and over time, I developed that, that uh, really what I developed was a, a sense of spirit. Um, I got it from watching TV. Um, I watched the news. I watched the people of the 60s. People of the 60s, they didn't take crap. You know, they marched. They, they had free love and peace and flowers. And they marched. They said, no, we're not going to take it anymore. They said, no, and they had music, the Grateful Dead and Blind Faith and Traffic, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And they had, you know, that spirit. And they had Kung Fu, you know. <laughs> David Carradine was a star of that television show. And I just, uh, I, I, you know, still to this day, some of my best spiritual moments are watching that show. You know, he's just so... <laughs> Some of you might remember that show. And, you know, it was a, a Buddhist priest who walked the Wild West in bare feet. I mean, this guy was tough, you know. <laughs> he'd walk from town to town, and sometimes he'd be met because he looked different. He walked, acted different. You know, he'd be met by whole groups of guys, you know, who didn't like him just because of the way he looked. And they'd assault him verbally, you know. Bah! And he'd stand there, and just pearls of Buddhist wisdom just rolled off his tongue. You know, and you'd see the look come over their face, and they'd change, and they'd go off to help people. <laughs> and I thought, that's power. That's real power. And then he'd walk to another town just in his, you know, with his little bag of herb. I don't know what was in that bag, but... <laughs> And he'd get to another town, and he'd meet a whole another group of people who would greet him at the... You know, and they, this time they'd assault him physically. And when they did that, he'd kick their butts. <laughs> I wanted what he had. You know what I mean? I thought he was the epitome of strength and serenity. So I've got these ideas swirling around in my I'm studying, I'm reading everything on I can on channeling and and uh, and peace and meditation and and uh, uh, you know taking a lot of things, trying to be introduced into that spirit world. And uh, um, and and all the while, I can't let go of a drink. All that, all the while, I can't let go of the drink. Um, but I got, I, it, so I, I'm in this girl's home at the end of all this. My roommate's on the same page. You know, I said all that to tell you that she and I, we got the same thing going on. And man, our friends said, all those people moved to Oregon. There are people and they're in Oregon. We went out the second story window, that girl's home down the tree and into Randy's truck and off to Oregon where God might be. <laughs> and we moved up into uh, the Eugene Springfield area where it's a college town and everybody's kind of groovy and cool and their throwbacks from the sixties anyway, you know, and I thought, here we are. Here we are. My life's going to change from the outside in. We rented a little house, and they let me come with them, and we planted a garden in the front yard. And that's where I learned that in Oregon, when they talk about hoe, and they meant with a tool. You know, it was a, it's a whole different thing. But two things happened that I certainly couldn't see while it was happening. I could only see it looking back. And one was when we, we couldn't always drink the way I needed a drink. I didn't know that. I didn't know it that much about alcoholism. And I... Uh, uh, when I, even when I got here, but certainly not back then. And, and when we couldn't drink the way I needed to drink, and I've got no booze, and I've got no steps or fellowship or God of my understanding, nothing that buffers me from you. I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. You know, the obsession is already set in, and I don't know it. And I can't guarantee when I do drink it, whether I'm going to have two or 22 already, still and again at 17. Um... So I didn't see it coming, but uh, I, be, I become very hard to get along with when I can't drink the way I need to drink. And, and when I can, and I'm overshooting the mark all the time, my friends had to ask me to leave. They had no choice. You know, lots of people, lots of times said, Carla, we love you, but you got to go. You got to go. 
And I went, and I ended up back down in my father's house against his better judgment, and I hadn't been with him in a very, very long time. All, we'd spent my entire childhood, uh, or my entire adolescence anyway, um, you know, in lockups and visit, visitations and lockups and, and trying to figure out what's wrong with Carla and how to help you and how to help buy you some time. He used to say, they're just trying to buy you some time, Carla. Um, but I was at his house uh, for just about six months. Every morning we'd get up at the same time every day and he'd go off for work and I'd go sit in his den and I'd drink from his liquor cabinet and, and he'd come home in the afternoon and he'd see me sitting in the very spot where he left me that, that morning and I'd have nothing to say for myself. I didn't know how to tell him I was afraid. I didn't know that's what I was. I didn't know how to tell him I didn't know where the last few years of my life had gone. I sat on his couch and I drank his booze until right before my 18th birthday he came to me and he said what I know were the hardest words he ever had to say to his oldest daughter. And that's, I'm not going to watch you die and I'm not going to help you do it. you got to go. And on my way out the door, all I could remember is that one of the counselors at the rehab had told me I was a great actress. And I know today I must have misunderstood that, but I ended up on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> And there's not a lot of auditioning going on out there, I can promise you that. I was 18 years old, starting my days off with a pint of pop-off vodka, and I would go wherever the day took me. And some days it was a party, and some days it was just surviving. And there was not a lot of hope about it getting any different. And to this day, I love driving through Hollywood. I love driving down Sunset Boulevard past that same bus stop near Poinsettia Avenue. I see a whole new generation of the same girls sitting out there with very little hope about it getting any different. And I get to say a prayer of hope for her and a prayer of gratitude for myself. Maybe someday she'll get to find what I found here in Alcoholics Anonymous if alcoholism is her problem. A few months into that, I met a man walking down Hollywood Boulevard and I saw the light in his eyes and I didn't realize it was orange sunshine, but we hit it off and <laughs> I moved in with him that night and I didn't even know his last name. And six weeks later, he's asking me to leave and I still don't know his last name. <laughs> But I like to bring him up because years later he was on my eight-step list. He was someone who came to mind doing that four-step. You know, I, you, some of them people, you hardly ever have to get the writing done. You know, you're almost just barely done, and you go, oh, yeah, ready, willing, and able. You know, and I went everywhere I knew to look to get to make those amends to him, and and I couldn't find him. I spent the last part of my first year of sobriety looking for him, and, of course, I couldn't find him. And my sponsor finally said, you know, you're going to have to leave that alone. You've got to let that go for a while. If you're supposed to find that guy, you'll find him. But in God's time, not yours. You know, right now, you're chasing your tail now. It's just beginning, you know, you're not working. So, you know, but in the meantime, there are some things you can do to begin to change in that area. Like, try being a friend to a man in a vertical fashion. Why don't you start there? <laughs> Simple. You know, and I love it, because all these years later, all these years later, I have friends of both genders. I know how to be a friend. I know how to have a friend. And there is not a room in the world I can't walk into and look somebody in the eye, everybody in the eye. And I don't get those looks of contempt and pity and, and disdain from men or women. And I love that. Right up there with that feeling of being useful is that feeling of self-respect. And you can't take that from me. I can give it away. Maria talked last night about us selling ourselves out, and I can certainly do that in sobriety as well as I did uh, before. But you taught me how to be different. Right before my 13th AA birthday, I had to go give a talk on the other side of town. It was a hot Sunday afternoon, and I didn't feel like going. And thank God you guys have taught me it's not how I feel, it's what I do that matters. And I went out and I gave that talk. You know, I used to think I could just blow off a dinner for two and not be missed, really. You know, showing up was not my strong suit. <laughs> what does it matter? But don't you dare not invite me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want to go. I just want to be invited. So I went out and I gave that talk. And of course I felt better. Of course I did. And, and uh, uh, when the talk was over, uh, the thank you line came through, and this man stopped, and he said, where were you in 1976? And it was a guy from Hollywood Boulevard standing in front of me with eight and a half years of sobriety, and I with almost 13. Now, it's just my belief that only a very well-organized, loving God could have made that happen when it, all my efforts to get that done just didn't make it happen, couldn't get it done on my own accord at my, in my own time. And I just like to tell that story because it reminds me in all these times of uncertainty when I can't see that far ahead of me, you know, and I can't remember the last time something came together, you know, and I, and I just, and I get impatient. That's a story that I can, that's a touchstone. That's a touchstone for me. One of many now. So I got to make those direct amends to him, and he said, Oh, God, Carla, that's long forgiven, long forgotten. I just can't believe you're still alive. 
And he's right, you know, for all of us. Somehow, some way, we've managed to slip through that window of grace one more day to come in here and sit together and recharge and regroup and see what we can go back out there and pack into the stream of life. I don't know what that is, because I know a lot of us get a chance. The only thing I know that happened this time that made it different was that I did something different. I didn't feel different when I got here. I felt bad. I felt like I didn't know if I could trust this, but I kept coming anyway. You know, I just did something different. I didn't think something different when I got here. I did something different. Until it took. All of a sudden it took. That horrible obsession was relieved about nine months into sobriety. I learned how to be so happy for you when you came in with two days and said, oh, the obsession has been lifted. Yay! (laughs) But it works if it doesn't, you know. You can do it if it doesn't. Hurts, but you can do it. Um, Anyway, that was... was that took a while. You know, I, I left Hollywood after that year and I hooked up with another guy from another rehab because that's where they keep the boyfriends, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> another, and again, you know, in our book talks about being, having moral and philosophical convictions galore. You know, I want to be this. There's a certain ideal of who I want to be. I want to be peace and love and all of those things. I want to be that. And I can't, he and I can't stop knocking the hell out of each other really long enough to implement the principles fully of peace and love. That's how we dealt with things. We want to be this and we have to be that. I can't get there from here. So we beat each other up and down the California coast and pitched a tent in the mountains in southern Oregon and we lived there till the rains came and then we moved into a roofless cabin just north of Grants Pass and about five miles in off the highway, five miles up a mountain and found an old burnout log cabin that somebody had used 75 years earlier and we threw a plastic tarp over the top, called it a skylight and then the baby came. And we had this little girl, and I thought having this little girl, I mean, full flight from reality, okay? Because I think we're living off the land, and that I'm meditating, and uh, we're drinking moonshine and homemade wine because it's organic. (laughs) It kind of makes itself if you do it right. (laughs) So I've got this little girl, and she's supposed to be top priority, right? And we all know that alcoholism doesn't care who you love. Quickly, the booze became priority, and then she and I, she got in the way of one of our fights when she was about 10 months old, and I had to take her up to Idaho, where it's got to be better somewhere else, got to be better, got to be better up the road. Hope is just up the road. And I took her up there, and my first legitimate work was uh, working in the bars, and, and I loved working in the bars. I mean, to me, it was just like God was being, the cosmos were being very efficient, you know? I mean, it never occurred to me not to drink on the job. Why else would you have those jobs? So I was tending bar and cocktail waitressing, and a normal person could have made a great living doing what I was doing, and I still couldn't bring home enough money to pay rent for more than a week at a time. So we're living in the rent-by-the-week motels up there, and my kid's one of those kids that you see in a T-shirt and underwear and yesterday's lunch down the front of it because the mom's not paying attention. And we just kind of went from pillar to post up there till after a while, of course, Idaho's not working for us either. And we got to come back down. I'm renting a room from uh, my aunt in L.A. and in a place called Covina. And I'm working in a bar in Hollywood. And that's about 35, 40 miles between each other. And every afternoon, she's almost four years old by then. Every afternoon, I kiss her goodbye and I take off for the bar in Hollywood. And I'd stop at the halfway point, which is a bar in Arcadia called the First Cabin. And I'd stop in there and I'd have my primer drinks, those drinks that got me ready to go do my shift, those shots of Cuervo Gold and Bud Backs. Every afternoon, like clockwork, stop in there, shoot them beers, social, buy, and go off to work. And one afternoon, I kissed my girl goodbye, and I took off, and I stopped at that same bar in Arcadia, had those same shots of gold and same bud backs, and to this day, I don't know what was different on that day from the day before, except for 24 hours, because I didn't hate that job in Hollywood, and I didn't love my daughter any less on that day than I love her today. But I sat on that bar stool, and I drank those drinks, and I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. No, no matter how great the necessity or the wish, I couldn't stop. So I sat on that bar stool and I lost them both in one fell swoop. The kid and the job were gone. And I stayed and I lived off the kindness of strangers there in that little area in Arcadia for about a month until I fell into another job in another dive bar, met the man I would marry there. Because here I'm thinking, no, if I, it's just this business. It's this business. If I could get out of this business now, get married, get the kid back, get an apartment, make my life look like I think yours does. 
do it all, get it all back together. And he and I got married about the time we should have split up. And we <laughs> moved into that apartment. And it, we're looking legit. Quickly, we became the neighborhood entertainment. <laughs> we settled our arguments with a shotgun. Whoever gets to that gun first wins. My first exposure, to, real exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous came after one of those fights. We were fighting over whether or not I should get off the bar stool, and I lost that fight, and I ended up with some black eyes and broken ribs again. Not a lot of people feeling sorry for me in that bar, just glad I was leaving. My husband had to pick me up and take me to the hospital and get me fixed up, and then we got fixed up, and then he brought me home, and he had to leave for work that weekend, so before he left, he set me up with a giant ice chest full of beer and a bottle of beef eater gin chilling on top. And now I'm drinking gin because tequila had been making me so mean. I mean, you understand, right? <laughs> so he's gone, and I'm dialing the phone. And I don't know if we have any, any other drunk dialers in the room, but I, I don't know all of who I called. <laughs> but I'm drinking the gin and dialing the phone, and I, 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 called, I eventually called a battered woman shelter because that's what I felt like. I, I, thought, I think I'm a battered woman. And the woman who answered the phone asked me if I'd ever been to an AA meeting. I don't know how she made that leap, but she did. <laughs> <laughs> what I heard her say was that if I went to an AA meeting, she'd fix my life. It'd be all done. Okay. So I found a wonderful AA meeting. It was a perfectly wonderful meeting, not far from where I lived. It was there then. It's there now. And the only thing I went there without was readiness. And you can't give that to me. You can't make me ready. Our friend Bill Cleveland says that there's a, when somebody's ready, there's nothing you can say wrong, and when somebody's not, there's nothing you can say right. And I went there, and I heard a woman talk for about 45 minutes that night. I, I sat there, and I listened in all my self-pity and listened, thinking I was looking for an answer in all of that. And I, all I heard her say during that whole 45 minutes was that somewhere during her drinking career, she switched to beer, so I did. <laughs> I thought AA says switch to beer, the representative from Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> so I left there and I switched to beer. And beer gave me the great illusion that I was controlling my drinking. Beer's not really drinking anyway, is it? I didn't think so. I didn't think it was drinking. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's got all those hops and barley and wheat. It's like a breakfast food, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's not really like a whole grain breakfast food. So, But I lived on that illusion for another couple of years. You know, it was more soothing to my body. It, it uh, allowed me to get a little further into my day before it was all gone. Allowed me to put things together a little bit to, to get my daughter back a few years later. Took a few years. Got a little job answering phones for the city. This is my last year, last year drinking. We had moved into a little apartment across town, me and my husband and the kid. A little tiny place, but it felt like a palace. And we're drinking. We have one more of those fights, one more time, one more time, where the cops are in the driveway, one more time. Neighbors are peeking out the window, wondering what's going on at Charlie and Carla's house, one more time. The kid's standing now over in the corner in her mismatched clothes and her unkempt hair, and she got that look of fear in her eyes one more time. And I can't try to tell her it's going to be any different. And I see my life falling down around me, and I can't stop. I'm sitting on the couch with my 12-pack, and I can't stop. My husband left. The cops left. They took the gun. Everybody's gone. It's me and the kid and the booze. I was in a much better financial position by that time than I'd, ever, than I'd been in a very, very long time anyway. I was living indoors. I had that little job. Even though that last torturous year, you know, I was like, I had this little job as answering phones for the city, great job, great benefits, all those things that everybody shoots for, right? And we want to do well, you know, it wasn't like a, I wanted to be a, a loser for all my life. Once in a while, you know, you want to do well, get it together. Sometimes I'd try to get to work without taking those morning drinks, you know, just so I didn't smell, just so I could just say, I made it clean today to stop the shake. So, so. I try not to drink and to, to stop the shaking. I'm shaking. I'm getting there. And when I'm not drinking, it's all I can think about. I'm either drinking or thinking about drinking that whole last year. I'm drinking or thinking about drinking, drinking or thinking about drinking. So this last day after this fight, it's my, uh, uh, everybody's gone. It's me and the kid and the booze. And my first sponsor told me if I wanted to affect a conscious contact with a power greater than myself, I could start by counting the coincidences that happened in my life. 
And one of the first ones I could count was that I had moved in next door to a woman who had five years of sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. And she had seen and heard that whole thing go down that afternoon, that Saturday afternoon. And she came over a couple days later and she knocked on my door and she brought me a big book and a 12 and 12 and she just sat on my couch and she told me her story. She was a woman properly armed with the facts about herself and she sat down and she talked about her and in her story I heard me. I heard that she used to drink like me. And I'd seen with my own eyes over the last year that she wasn't drinking anymore. And what impressed me more about that was it didn't seem to bother her that she wasn't drinking. That got my attention. Because when I'm, when I'm sober, when, I've got no, when I'm not drinking, and I've got no steps or fellowship or God of my understanding, I feel like you've stripped the coating off my wires. You know, I feel oversensitive and underloved. I don't know what you meant by that or why you looked at me that way. And my life closes in on me from there. My head closes in on me from there, so much so that even though I'm going to look at that first drink and even though I know what's going to happen, even though I know, I don't know, I don't even have to know all of what alcoholism is, but even though I know that I can't guarantee if I'm going to have two or 22, I know that I don't have to invite trouble anymore. It comes unsolicited. I know that that window of relief is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And knowing all of that, when I'm in that self-centered panicked, diseased mind, there's going to be nothing that stands between me and that first drink. And once I've taken the first one, I'm off. So I don't know how her 12 little thinly veiled Sunday school steps are going to have any real effect on me in the face of what I'd become. It seemed like I'd heard it all before. And it was about a week and a half later that I just didn't go back and buy any more booze. I just didn't go back. And I spent the weekend at home. My daughter was somewhere else, and I was at home, and I stayed in. And I shook, and I saw things and heard things that weren't there, and I shook, and I sweated, and I, and I sat there. And I don't know why. There wasn't a conscious decision. It was just, I just wasn't going anywhere. And I shook into Monday, and I shook into Tuesday. And by Tuesday afternoon, I was stark raving sober. Terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. What do I do now? And I went back to my neighbor instead of the store. It was another left turn instead of right. I just did something different. I went back to my neighbor and I asked her what to do. And she sent me up to a meeting in Sierra Madre, California. And that became my first home group. And I went up there and I didn't know what I was going to find. But I went in there. I don't even know if what you call, what was on in me, what was going on in me was willingness. <laughs> but I was doing it. So it must have been. I went up there and I sat way back by the exit sign, by the open door, just in case. But what I heard that night, the first sign of hope that I heard that night in that meeting was it came in the form of small talk. You know, that sound of chatter that we hear before the meetings. You know, everybody's asking each other, how you doing? How you doing? Do you have a sponsor yet? Did you get a big book? Do you need a cup of coffee? Did you get a good seat? Didn't your kid have an interview yesterday? Didn't you start school How's your lawn? <laughs> Could my life ever be so elegant and simple as to be concerned about a lawn? I mean, except for to pass out on. You know what I mean. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know, but something fun is kind of going on. And I stayed till the end, and the secretary did something very nice for me. She came to me, and she asked me if I'd read that close. What, in Southern California, we read a portion of Chapter 11, a vision for you at the end of a lot of meetings. And I took it from her. I said yes. That's what I did. I said yes. And as I, said, as I read a little bit, I came into the room a little bit, you know, just like I do every time I say yes to something you ask me to do. Every time I'm stacking a chair or dumping an ashtray or washing a coffee cup or shaking somebody's hand, I come into the room just a little bit more. Making coffee, I'm in the room. Keeps me in a posture of hearing and delivering the message. I never know when my spirit, I, you know, I have days like that all the time, you know, when I, 25 years later, have days where nothing's quite caught up and I come to my meeting and I'm stacking chairs and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. And then I never know who's going to walk by me with that one line or it's going to set me right again. Oh, yeah. I never know who's walking behind me, who's looking to see if Carla's doing it. Maybe I can, too. You know, yes, yes is still the best answer for me all these years later. 
And I started going to meetings and I was staying sober midnight to midnight. And they were talking about steps and I didn't know what was going on really. I didn't understand it, but I got a sponsor. I asked a woman to sponsor me and she was an older woman and I didn't, uh, I didn't relate to her in any way really that I knew of, except that I heard her say that she hadn't had a drink in 12 years. And that got me. I mean, 60 days, yeah, that's good. But I mean, this thing had been working in her for 12 years. And that was serious to me. Because I didn't know if this Alcoholics Anonymous thing wasn't going to be just one more thing. One more thing where I'm in here, I walk the walk, talk the talk, up the wall, over and out. 12 years. She didn't drink anything like me, except that she drank a lot. She drank and stayed where she was. I drank and ran around. I started taking the steps of my sponsor, and I made that first round of amends to my family at about nine months, and it was right about that time that horrible obsession to drink was lifted. And I don't know when exactly it was, but it, just right around that time. I knew For a long time, for a few months into sobriety, you know, I'd get up in the morning and it'd be on me. You know, is it going to be today? Am I going to drink today? Am I going to drink? Am I not going to drink? Am I going to drink? Am I not going to drink? Am I going to drink? Am I not? In my head all day long, you know, just go do this. Go answer the phones. Go do this. You know, it was very... You know, somebody, I, I drank after the first 89 days for a day, you know, because as soon as I started drinking, I realized that I wanted what I'd had just a few minutes ago, even with all the discomfort that came with it. But I had to finish that drunk. And then, my, so the next night, my sponsor came and picked me up, and she brought me to the big book study that night, and that was the last night I ever had to have a drink. And I went up there, and I was sitting there. I was not very pretty. I was not in great condition. And somebody came over to me, and thank God nobody sat in the meeting and went, ew, somebody smells like booze. You know, some guy came over to me and he said, hey, you want to come up on Tuesday and make coffee with me? I thought, dang, somebody thinks I'm going to be here on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so then the real deal started, you know, the real deal started and I, and I took the steps and, and, uh, and I had that coffee maker commitment and that guy quit showing up and I ended up with the coffee maker commitment uh, myself and I got out of work at five o'clock and at 5.05 I was in the meeting because... I was in the store buying stir sticks and coffee creamer and, and birthday cards and all that stuff. And I was thinking about you. I was thinking about what needs to be done. I was out of me for a few minutes. I was experiencing the relief of the bondage of self. You know, I had me off my mind for a change. You know, I couldn't get my head around what the term self-centeredness was. I didn't get that. I had the nerve to tell you that I can't be self-centered. I'm a mom. <laughs> and I just gave you a thumbnail about what kind of mother I was. So I couldn't get it in a dictionary, definitive kind of way. I had to experience the lack of self-centeredness. And I had to get comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable. You know, um, everything I live, I have to live out of my comfort zones today. I have to live where I'm uncertain. I have to live in the unknown. I have to be peaceful with the unpeaceful, you know. And now I'm getting to like it. Um, but I, I made that first round of amends to my family. And, and uh, you know, to this day, there's not one member of my family who'll stand in the doorway and say, no, please don't go to the meeting. You know, they never do. <laughs> they never say that. And I was going to two and three meetings a day. And I got to tell you, for the first couple of years, I think I needed every one of those meetings. You know, I was just always in one at noon and, and a couple at night. And, and uh, I was trying to raise this kid. And I was paying rent for more than a month in a row. And, and I was going to work. And, and uh, other women started asking me to sponsor them. And I got to tell you, the, the only fifth step I like better than mine is yours. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because in your eyes, I see redemption. And I see forgivability. And I see lovability. And I see hope and growth where I don't always see it in myself. And when the light comes on in your eyes, it burns brighter in me. And I'm one of those big believers that you got to give it away to get it. And I hope that you stay long enough to experience that. Because there is no way you can get it off listening to somebody else doing that. You can get hope from there. But I know I had to experience it. After a couple of years, I'd had you guys. My daughter didn't have anybody. And she, started, she was 12 years old now, coming home at all hours of the night, beat up and bloody. She'd been jumped into a gang and starting to find her sense of family and camaraderie out in the street where I used to. And it was time to get worried. You know, I was busy being wonderful and alcoholics anonymous, you know, two and three meetings a day. And, 
And, you know, on page 19, right up front, it doesn't wait till the end to tell us that a more important demonstration of our principles happens in our homes, occupations, and affairs. And if I'm only doing it in these rooms, I'm only half doing it. So it was time for me to stop going to two and three meetings a day, go to a meeting, go to work, go home and be a mom to that kid. But she needed a little bit bigger help by that time. And so I had to put her in a treatment center for a while. And thank God there was a place for her. And it was for me to show up. It was for me to offer her that relationship if she wanted it. And we went through a lot of bumps and we went through a lot. I had become the very parent I said I'd never be and maybe worse. But it was for me to offer that to her, whether she wanted it from me or not. And I'd show up when they asked me to. And sometimes she'd have a letter there that said all the reasons she hated me. And then sometimes I'd go and she'd have a letter there that all the reasons she loved me. And by after that six months was over, she came home and things were better, but they weren't perfect. You know, you guys taught me how to live with life's unresolved problems without having to take a drink to settle it. You know, I live in the uncertainty. You guys taught me mountains are moved a spoonful at a time. And she uh, wanted to go live with her dad for a while, and I had to step back and let her go do that. And, you know, I have to tell you that I have discovered in, in uh, sobriety that Alcoholics Anonymous, does, it, it teaches me how to live with my problems, but it doesn't remove them. I mean, things happen in life. Things happen to people that never drank. People get sick. People get in wrecks. People, people have stuff happens. So about five years into my sobriety, I'm going to the gym, I'm working, she's living with her dad, and I come home from the gym one night, and I go to bed as usual, and I woke up in the middle of the night, there's a man standing over my bed with a knife to my neck and his hand over my mouth, and he said, don't say a word or I'll cut your head off. And he took the telephone cord, and he tied my hands behind my back, and he raped me, and he robbed me that night in my room. And I want to tell you that at five years of sobriety, I had a much bigger God than I got here with, and I had a certainty with a God, a God that I didn't understand, a God that I didn't have to know or describe or or uh, or or fully define. There's a man on my back in the middle of the night, in the middle of my bed, and I'm saying a prayer. <laughs> if my daughter has to hear some bad news about her mom, please have someone be there with her. And it wasn't until later I realized that, you know, it was only Alcoholics Anonymous that could fit me to be of the presence of mind to say a prayer like that at a time like that. So he was there for a few hours, and and then uh, we got into a we, we kind of waited till a strategic time, and then we we uh, got into kind of a wrestling match, and then I my own bolt lock wouldn't unlock on the front door, and I couldn't get out, and and but it shook him up, it shook him up enough to where in a in a, I don't know a half hour later or so he went out the same window he came in, he came in through the kitchen window, and it turned out that I knew him, I'd actually watched him get sober thirty days before I did. I watched him get sober, I watched him get his life, his wife, his kids, and everything back, and then I watched him join the church and leave AA behind, and when he went out, he went out like that. And what I chose to learn from that is that while the big book tells us to be quick to see where religious people are right, this is where I learned the terms and conditions of my alcoholism. This is where I learned that I'm not one of those people who can go home after a Sunday sermon and have a glass of wine. I remember that here, and then I can go anywhere I want to and worship. in addition to, but not instead of, Alcoholics Anonymous, not for me. <clears throat> By that time, I had a, a man named Lee was sponsoring me. Uh, at my first sponsor, thank God I didn't have to have the God she had. You know, she taught me the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't like her God very much. I didn't like a lot of things about the way she believed, but she did, said, you don't have to believe the way I do. You get to have your own. And so when she left Alcoholics Anonymous, a couple years later, I got to stay. And I asked Lee to be my sponsor, and he was just one of those good old boys. He was someone who, I, you know, I, I didn't need to be told to go to meetings, and I had enough friends where I could do step work and stuff if it was so intimate I needed a woman. And he was just someone to be accountable to, and he was a good old boy. You know, he'd say things like, whoa, that's going to feel a whole lot better as soon as it quits hurting. <laughs> <laughs> And I love him today. He's still sober today. I watched him bury his son a couple years ago. And then I watched him go about the business of trying to help other alcoholics who were losing their kids. I love a sermon I can see. And then I, 
So he was my sponsor at the time, and this had happened, and it was clear to us I needed to ask a woman, and, and so I asked Marguerite. And I always say that Joanne and Lee gave me my sobriety, and Joanne, I mean, uh, Marguerite gave me my soul back. And um, she, the first thing she said was that you're going to have to forgive this guy. You know you're going to have to forgive this guy. And and uh, I, and I know that. I know she's right. At five years of sobriety, I know that we're people who can't handle even seemingly justifiable resentments. But the guy had scared me. The guy had scared me, and man... You know, at five years of sobriety, fear was fear still made, meant for me to be angry. Anger, anger was the best way for me to guard against fear. Anger made, made me feel purposeful and like you can't hurt me. And yet at five years of sobriety, anger is like a suit that doesn't fit anymore. I can't be angry. I can't not be angry. And it's time to change. And I don't want to let go. Ego says, if I die, you die. They're going to walk all over you. And yet I know I got to let go. So that seven-step prayer came in very handy. It was a daily mantra, all day, every day. Because I want to be that. Moral and philosophical convictions galore. I want to be that, and I am this. And there was a trial that followed. They caught the guy a few weeks later, and as part of the defense, they had a lot of the guys I'd known years before get up and testify as to who I used to be, including my ex-husband, and that's the mark I'd left on him, was the fact that he was more inclined to testify on behalf of the rapist than he was for me. I've never, he's never been interested in any of my amends, and so I have to be okay with that now, and unless something changes in the future. So I had to get a character witness for, for me, for, to, to testify as to who I was at five years of sobriety, and by that time I was working at a big fancy financial firm downtown Los Angeles, a place I never even would have walked in the front doors of years before, and people like Henry Kissinger walk the halls of this place. And I was walking undetected. Because <laughs> I was just showing up, doing what they asked me to do. And the division head, the department head there, offered to come and testify on my behalf. And they told him all about who I used to be. And he said, yeah, but she shows up early and she stays late. And she was where she said she was. And see, that's Alcoholics Anonymous speaking for itself. He didn't have to be coached. She just got up and told the truth as he'd experienced it through me. And then it was my turn to testify, and I'm still looking for this window of forgiveness. I know it just takes a little chink in the armor for that to start, but I don't know where it's going to come from. And so I get up, and I'm sitting in the witness stand, and I look out at the defense table, and I see him sitting there. And that's a place where I could sit. I've sat before. I could sit again. If I were to take a drink, it occurred to me that I was just like him. There's a little recipe for forgiveness on page 67 in our book that says that though we didn't like the... the uh, their actions or the uh, the way they they uh, their actions manifest. Uh, now I'm going to misquote it. You got to look page 67 top. <clears throat> but he like me was perhaps spiritually sick. They like ourselves. He like me, not me from a spiritual mountaintop. That's not where the forgiveness comes from. The forgiveness comes from the fact that I could be sitting in his very seat. That I am like him. Maybe not in the same exact way. But as a human being who could screw somebody's life up real good, cause, cause damage and be that proverbial tornado, yeah, that's me. And just like a crack of light under the doorway, I began to just, just, just enough hope, just, just enough willingness came in to start to relinquish that fear and to let it go. And it took about 18 months for all the nightmares and stuff attendant to that to finally dissipate, but they did. They did, and I don't walk around a victim. I know how valuable that inventory is. I know how valuable that is. I know how valuable it is not to walk around with the past coloring my present moment, because this is the moment. This is the moment for all of us, and this is the moment I had always, always been afraid of, always been afraid of. I couldn't live in this one. I thought when I got sober, I was going to OD on over-awareness. <laughs> this moment. And if I'm full of resentment, I can't be here with you. I can't. I can't see you clearly. I can't love you. And it's when I'm loving you that I feel it. So that trial was over and he was sentenced to 20 years and he did 17 and the detective who worked the case came to me and he said, I don't know who you were back then. I'm not even sure I want to know, but whatever it is you're doing now, you keep doing it because it seems to be working. And see, that's Alcoholics Anonymous speaking for itself. Afterwards, we found out that that trial, that that whole courtroom was sort of 
dusted with the 12 step fairy dust. You know, I mean, the judge we found out had been sober. The court reporter was the Al Anon mother of a woman in my report. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't know any of that. It was just kind of one of those little bonuses, you know. He's not been able to stay out of prison, but I know it works in prison. I know it works because I've had the privilege of going up there into those prisons and and into county and uh, talking to those people. And the guys up in prison, some of those guys are never getting out. They are never getting out. And yet through the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, they found a way to be of service to each other and to the people they've harmed. And they walk spiritually free. And I don't know what impresses me more, that or the fact that when I go into county, and now I haven't done that in a while, but when I, when I would go into county and I'd go in and bring a panel uh, in there and, I, and after the meeting someone would come up to me and go, you know, I used to be secretary of the so-and-so meeting. I used to sponsor. I used to. That's a powerful message to me. I wish that that was, you know, I... I our problems of our, our, of our own making, and after that was over, you know, you'd think that, I, you, <laughs> I don't know what I thought, but I went back to work, and, uh, um, and, and life was in session, you know, and I just, uh, uh, a couple years later, I, I, uh, my daughter came back to live with me, and a couple years later, I met, the, I met a, a man that I thought God was being very efficient with, a business partner and a boyfriend. You know, I, I just, I met him in a meeting, and, and uh, it, I, just here's where I want to tell you that if you're going to be in a relationship, it's a good idea to be in the same relationship they're in. <laughs> and, uh, and we got together, and long story short, I, I went into business with him, and I ended up bankrupt at 10 years sober and, and very, very depressed. You know, I thought, wait a minute, you know, wait a minute. And I just want to tell you that I had to start, I had to move home groups. I got uh, a lady as, uh, I, I asked Rita to be my sponsor because I knew she had paid back a whole lot of money. She didn't think she needed to pay back either. And, and, um, and I paid back the money that I owed, and... Um, and I got, I had to start over in Alcoholics Anonymous without drinking. Um, and, uh, and life got better again, you know, I had it bigger and better and same stuff, same solutions, same steps, fellowship, God of my understanding, just reconnecting, starting over. I didn't have to drink and say, well, what the hell anyway? I just, you know, got back up and, and took some more action, took some different action. My daughter came back to live with me, and, and uh, she sat down in front of me with her boyfriend one afternoon, and I told them they were pregnant, and they nodded. <laughs> and this was, she was 16 years old, and I, it was my chance to be able to tell her, I'm going to be there for you no matter what. Whatever you decide, I'm there. You know, so I was there holding her hand when we were counting off the contractions, and I was there. I was there when my first little grandson was born. And... A little over 18 years ago, she, uh, she, you know, she spent her senior year in high school, homeschooled, most of it homeschooled, but she got to graduate cap and gown with everybody. And we have a picture of my little grandson being a month old and, and my daughter in her cap and gown and my father and me. And then just a couple months ago, my grandson, that same grandson graduated cap and gown from high school. And so we've come full circle with that. And, and I've got to be a witness. I am a privileged witness to my life and to yours. Now I have two grandsons, and they've never seen their grandmother drunk, you know. And uh, I got to sit with them just a couple of years ago and watch their mother graduate from uh, Cal Poly Pomona with a bachelor's degree. And now she's working on her master's. I got to tell you, that apple ran screaming from the tree, you know what I mean? Just, <laughs> woo! <laughs> My dad doesn't have to sit up nights anymore watching the news to make sure his daughter's name isn't on the list of the victims of the serial killers of the day. He sleeps well and he knows why. And he had to tell me that story. Up until that time, I was about 12 years sober, he had to tell me that story about how he'd sit. He couldn't find any comfort, any way to go to sleep at night when he didn't know where I was except to watch the news and hope that my name wasn't mentioned. And I'm so self-centered that, during, that it took many, many <laughs> took a long time for me to think, when the hell is he going to stop telling that story? Isn't like a few times enough? And that didn't mean things weren't getting better as we were going. You know, at five years of sobriety, or uh, no, at, now I've learned it's about six or seven years of sobriety, I got to walk through prostate cancer with him. 
you know, and as I admitted him into the, lo- into the lobby of the Ken Norris Cancer Center, I looked out the bay window there and I saw the rooftops of the juvenile hall. <laughs> <laughs> and we both agreed that we liked that view better. <laughs> I was about 12 years sober, and I took my dad to lunch one afternoon, and he was going to start in on one of those stories again, you know. We were having some spaghetti or something, and he, and he says, starts in with, you know, I have no pictures of you when you were a teenager. And I'm thinking, oh, God. And I'm not, you know, I'm not showing that. It's like, okay, yes. <laughs> and I just want to listen. I want to sit in the posture of listening. You've taught me that. But I'm thinking, you know, Jesus, I've got sharp objects here. You know, when's this enough enough? <laughs> And so he finished the sentence by saying, but you know, to see you today, I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade today for all the pictures in the world. And see if I'd have stabbed him, I'd have missed that. (laughs) My dad danced at my wedding with me and he said, all I want is more of this. He loves Doug. Our families meshed together. My mom was a little harder. Even though I know I'd broken her heart, even though I knew I'd broken her heart over and over and over, after I did that inventory, even though I knew my side of the street, it was still very hard. You know, personalities or mothers and daughters or whatever it was, I don't know, but I had to work harder with her. And about two years before I got sober, my baby sister committed suicide at the age of 17, and it took her all weekend to die. Before, while she lay on life support in a in a uh, West Covina hospital, she was a, uh, you know, she was just on, on life support. Um, the family would gather in the in the waiting room, and and I'd go out to the parking lot where the booze was, and I'd drink, and I'd go back into the waiting room, and I'd just rake my mother across the coals, and I'd talk to her in a way a daughter should never talk to her mother, especially when her baby lay dying in the next room. And I don't know how you make amends for that, really, except that I started by calling her once a week and trying to find out how I might add to her life instead of take for a change. And it required listening. It required sitting different in my skin and listening, sitting back in a posture and listening, and finding out how I might add. And over time, we became very close again. Now, she was very forgiving. And it took a little longer for me. But we became very close. And so much so that about 13 years ago, my baby brother died of this disease. He was 30 years old, six foot 10, 160 pounds, when he lay on life support in a Spokane hospital. His heart was disintegrating literally from all the crank, and he wasn't going to stop drinking. And mercifully, when he died, I got to go and be the kind of a daughter my mother needed while she buried yet a second child. And I don't know what kind of pain that is for a parent, but I know that this time, because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I got to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And when she died just a few years ago of end-stage liver disease, we were clean and clear. We were clean and clear. And I called my stepfather, who was the love of her life. He was her third try, and they took They were together for many, many years, and they were just a wonderful example of love and devotion, even with all the troubles, you know, even with all the stuff going on. They were a wonderful example. And and so when my stepfather found out that Doug and I were together, now I met the love of my life many years ago, but I didn't know that's who it was. And uh, we met in AA about 13, 14 years ago, and uh, we didn't get together. We didn't even know we were supposed to be together until I was 21 years sober and 51 years old. So, you know, if you're looking, there's hope. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad I didn't stand around tapping my foot waiting for that one to happen, you know. <laughs> Saying, oh, I can't get sober if I don't have a boyfriend. Um, but uh, but we met at a conference. Well, we, we didn't meet, but we ended up at a conference speaking together, and we ended up talking and uh, just about four years ago. In fact, next uh, next week, August 8th, it'll be four years. That'll be our breakfast anniversary is four years ago. <laughs> we started talking, and as he told you the other night, that conversation hasn't stopped. And But my stepfather found out after we had been together a, a year or so, and he said, I know you and Doug are headed toward matrimony and what I'd like to do. And he said, I know your mom left you all her jewelry, and what I'd like to do is, is shine my ring up and give it to Doug so that the rings will be together again. And so the rings that we wear, the rings that we put on... Uh, to each other at our wedding are the rings that uh, my mom and my stepfather wore for years. And, uh, and so I think that that's a pretty good sign that my mom and I were clean and clear. Um, I'm a big prayer. I'm a big prayer and meditator. I, I uh, um, have gone through different versions of different forms of that over my sobriety. And, uh, 
you know, I just keep doing the same stuff. I got a sponsor. I got to be sponsored. I've got to, uh, I've had a few sponsors in my sobriety. I'm not one of those people who's had just one. And uh, every sponsor has walked me up to the next one. Um, <clears throat> I've always had to do something physical. I believe, fi and Bill Wilson used to talk about this. We don't talk about this much. I love reading those extra, those additional writings he wrote in Language of the Heart and all of those where, you know, he's, he's, he's growing up. He got sober and he's stayed sober 20 years and he wrote about that and what it's like at 20 and what it's like at 25. And, you know, um, but he talked about physical exercise, you know, and that gives us that serotonin, you know, to a degree that gives us that stuff we're looking for. You know, so I've tried that, uh, you know, I've done all kinds of that in my sobriety. Okay. Um, I mean, he had to get way back there and, whoa, you know, he's like, <laughs> she is too far in that. Um, <laughs> uh, I've had to, you know, I've done the gym, and that's very repetitive and very calming and all that. And then I tried uh, rollerblading, you know, and yeah, rollerblading is a very wonderful form of, of contemplative meditation, you know, shh. Down the sidewalk, you see the curb. You don't argue with the curb. The curb exists. <laughs> Lift your foot. You know. I tried surfing for a while, and my friend Lisa says that surfing is uh, like being in a domestically violent relationship without having to have a partner. And, uh, <laughs> So I'm trying everything. You know, I just try it, try it. I'm, I, I, I'm one of those who believes I'd be more sorry if I didn't try something. So try it. And I uh, still believe that. Um, but uh, uh, 47 years sober, I mean, 47 years old and 17 years sober, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting itchy against time to try something else, you know. And I don't know about you, but once in a while I get a little stiff and brittle. You get stiff and brittle taking yourself a little too seriously, right? You know, that perfectionism steps in. If I can't be perfect, my sponsees are going to be perfect. You know, and they're like, I don't want to call her, you call her. I don't want to call her, I love her, but I don't want to call her. <laughs> so I got to find something else, you know, to lighten up the, you know, shake off the brittle. And, and, uh, and I fell into an Arthur Murray dance studio, and I don't know why it was. I believe that I know there's a God to this day because he answers que still answers questions I don't ask out loud. And I don't even know that these questions need answering, you know, I just don't. And um, so I walk into this dance studio and I take a free rumba lesson. And now you cannot be stiff and brittle and take a rumba lesson. You just can't. You got to get a wiggle on. You know what I mean? You do. And and I'm about halfway through this rumba lesson and and the teacher stops. He slaps his forehead. He said, "Oh, Carla, do not try to dance like a good girl. I don't think they will believe you anyway." <laughs> In the ninth chapter of our book, it says, in God's hands, our dark past becomes our greatest possession. <laughs> and my past has been woven into a huge tapestry that is my life. It's there for those who need to see it. They see it. And yet I walk a free woman in the real world, awake and alive, and looking you in the eye. My friend Don Newcomb, he, the convict, not the baseball player, he came up to me one time and he said, he said, I didn't know about that dancing thing for you. He said, I thought that that was going to take you away from AA. He said, you loved it so much, I thought it might take you away. One of those things. And he said, but now what I see had to happen is that little, little girl who went to North Beach had to step aside so the lady who dances could come out. And you know, it's true for me. This moment is the most important moment all the time. This moment. This moment. And dancing gave that to me. And I'm not saying I'm leaving AA for dancing. I'm saying in addition to, not instead of. I didn't know that question need, was, needed to be answered again. I didn't know I didn't know that that gave me an ability to be intimate in a way I hadn't been before. I didn't know how. I didn't, I didn't know till it was happening. But when I'm standing in frame, when I'm standing in frame, and I learned things like the waltz. I mean, I was standing in a dance line one night, and I heard them play Moon River, and I started to cry. Me, I'm like, ACDC, and, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and they're playing Moon River, and I'm crying. Because when I stand in frame, and, I, and I'm not worried about the steps I'm about to take, and I'm not worried about the steps I just took, I'm not upset about making a mistake, and I'm just standing in frame, and I allow myself to be led, I never know what pattern I'm executing till I'm done. And in that way, I get to experience the great moment that is the now, this now, this moment, this moment where God is, this moment, clean and clear. And you gave that to me. I want to thank you for that. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.